you so much for this opportunity to share some of our work on lung stem cells and how we're using them to study the effects of cigarette smoking on COVID-19. I'm a physician scientist at UCLA and my lab has been studying lung repair and regeneration from lung stem cells for many years. But when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March, we decided to repurpose a lot of our lung stem cell models to study the virus. And so today I'm really happy to share with you some of the work that we've been doing on looking at the direct effects of cigarette smoke on COVID-19. So the lungs are complex and really vital organs. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about their structure and function and why some of the cells are so important in the airway. The upper part of the airway, which goes all the way from the nose down through the trachea and bronchi, is directly in contact with the environment. And so it plays a very important role in defending the body. And this is through this process of mucociliary clearance that we'll talk a lot more about today. The other part of the lungs that's important to note is the very lowest part of the lungs, which are these air sacs. And this is where gas exchange occurs, where oxygen enters our body and carbon dioxide leaves our body. And it's important to also note that the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19, can be involved and can affect any part of the airway, all the way from the nose down to the distal air sacs. And we're studying all of these different regions in the lab in different ways. But today, what I want to share with you is some of the work that we've been doing on these upper airways here. So mucociliary clearance is really vital in defending the body. And the way that this works is that we have this very highly specialized lining of our upper airways. And one of the specialized cells is called a goblet cell or a mucus producing cell that makes mucus that we're all familiar with. And this mucus is very important because it traps viruses, bacteria, pollution, any kinds of toxins that we may be breathing in. And then there are these other highly specialized cells called ciliated cells which have these tiny hair-like projections on the top. And these hair-like cells beat unidirectionally, and they beat to allow this mucus to be moved up and out of the body where it can be coughed up or, or swallowed. And in that way, um, the effects of these harmful particles is abrogated. And so there's one other really important cell type within this um, lining layer of the airways, which is called a basal cell. And this is really a true adult stem cell in the airway because it's capable of replicating and making more of itself. And it's also capable of making more cells, these differentiated cells, including these goblet mucus cells and these ciliated cells. And the way that this works is shown in this movie where these cilia beat unidirectionally and they're moving these particles up and out of the body and in that way um, preventing infection or other kinds of harmful things to happen. So we're fortunate that we have had for many years now a really good um, system where we can actually grow uh, these airway cells in the lab and we can have all of these features of this mucociliary airway. And again, I'm showing you a schematic here with these basal stem cells, the goblet mucus cells, the ciliated cells, and club cells, which also contribute to mucus. And I'm showing you where they look in the actual um, tissue. Um, this is actual tissue from a patient showing you what the lining um, epithelium of these upper airways looks like. And we're able in the lab to get these patient samples, and we are able to digest and strip away this upper lining of cells and then we can digest this upper lining into single cells. And when we do that, all of these differentiated cells will die, but these airway basal stem cells will persist. And then we're able to put them into this culture system, which essentially is what we call a transwell culture system. And that just means that we put these stem cells onto this membrane, which has got very, very tiny pores that will allow all the nutrients to come through, but won't allow the cells to crawl out. And then we grow them in this liquid, as I said, which has got all these nutrients, which is called media. And these are primary human bronchial epithelial cells, or HBECs, that are grown on this transwell membrane. And over a period of about five days, they divide, they proliferate, and eventually they form this very, very tight layer of cells on the bottom here, resting on the transwell. 
And then what we're able to do at that point is to actually remove the liquid media from the surface of the cultures and just have the media in the bottom of the cultures. And in this way, we create this air-liquid interface. And this provides the cue to allow these stem cells to go on and differentiate and make these mucous cells and ciliated cells. So this is a lovely system for us to study a large number of different processes um, in the lab. And the way that this looks is that we can actually go in and use fluorescent markers to stain um, particular kinds of cell types. So here in green, I'm showing you the ciliated cells. And then in red are the mucous cells. And then in white are the stem cells, these airway basal stem cells. And I want to mention that this work is being done by a really talented group of scientists in my lab, Arunima Perkayastha, Chandani Sen, and Abdo Dara. And so what we are able to do now is to take these air liquid interface cultures and we can expose them directly to cigarette smoke. And we have this very cool setup in the lab, which is really this airtight chamber. And we put the cells inside the chamber, inside their culture plate, and then we seal everything off. Uh, we light one of these research grade cigarettes. And then through a series of vacuum pumps, we're able to draw the cigarette smoke into the chamber, directly exposing the cells. And then we have a separate vacuum pump that will then draw the cigarette smoke out of the chamber. And in this way, we're able to replicate what smoking really looks like when people puff on a cigarette. And so this is the schematic of how we seed the stem cells. Um, then once they're confluent and um, the cultures look good, we take them to the air liquid interface. We allow the mucus and ciliated cells to differentiate over about 19 days. And then we expose once a day um, to smoking for about three minutes for four days. And then on the day after the smoking exposures, we add the live virus. And this is through a collaboration with Vaiti Arumagaswamy here at UCLA. Um, after three days, he deactivates the virus. And of course, all of this viral infection is done in our high containment BSL-3 conditions. So under very, very strict um, conditions. And then after the virus is deactivated, we're able to get these cultures back so that we can analyze them and, and, and look at the effects of smoking on the airway. And so this is an example of what um, the cultures look like. And um, here I'm showing you in green, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in blue is the DAPI, which is staining the nuclei of the cells. And the first um, culture here on the left is showing you where there's no cigarette smoke and just the virus. And I hope you can appreciate in green, you can see a cluster of cells that's been infected by the virus. And then on the right panel here, I'm showing you where cigarette smoke exposure was done before viral exposure. And here we see, um, and we've done this many times, and we consistently see that there's many more clusters of cells and the clusters tend to be larger. So we see a lot more infected cells if the cultures are exposed first to cigarette smoke. And this is also shown here on the right uh, with a viral load PCR reaction, which was done by Gustavo Garcia. And um, what we appreciate is that there is a lot more virus around um, when um, there is cigarette smoke exposure first. And so we then decided to look at the different kinds of cell types with each of these different exposure conditions to um, get a sense of what the virus is doing to the different cell types uh, and what cigarette smoke is doing to the different cell types. And so on the left uh, most panel, we have here no cigarette smoke, no virus. And this is, this is just a baseline in the adequate interface cultures, what the ciliated cells look like. And they're shown here in white. And then you can appreciate, I'm sure, that when we add cigarette smoke but no virus, we get a loss of, this, of the ciliated cells. But what was really interesting to us is that in the setting of viral infection um, with no cigarette smoke exposure, we don't see a loss of ciliated cells. The virus doesn't seem to be harming the ciliated cells and, and they're still present. And then in the setting where there's cigarette smoke and virus, we see a loss of ciliated cells, but this wasn't statistically significant. Now, when we have um, the, the situation of looking at the mucus cells, this is the baseline number of mucus cells that we typically see when there's no cigarette smoke and no virus. Here, when we see cigarette smoke, we see a lot of induction of mucus. And of course, this is probably no surprise to anybody because we know that cigarette smoke will induce mucus. In the setting of no cigarette smoke with virus, we see that there's really not a large increase in the number of mucus cells, uh, maybe a slight increase, but not, not, not statistically significant. And again, we did not see a statistically significant increase when there was cigarette smoke and virus.
So given these interesting effects of the virus on the different cell types, we decided to look at the, at the basal stem cells. And we look at this in two ways. One with a marker of stem cells, which is KRT5 or keratin-5. And here we see that with cigarette smoke, there is actually a large increase in the number of basal stem cells um, in the ALI cultures. And this is because the um, cigarette smoke is perceived by the cells as an injury. And so they respond to injury by dividing and making more stem cells. However, the virus alone without cigarette smoke does not induce that same proliferation of the stem cells. And we see a little bit more proliferation with cigarette smoke, but not a lot in the setting of viral infection. And then uh, we're also um, looking in another way at the stem cells by looking at the dividing and proliferating stem cells, which are shown here by these pink dots in the nucleus. And here we see that with cigarette smoke, we see a lot more of these dividing cells. But in viral infection, we don't see that the stem cells are dividing. And in the setting of cigarette smoke plus um, the virus, we saw sort of an in-between phenotype. And so the virus seems to be doing something very interesting in these air liquid interface cultures in that there doesn't seem to be much in the way of an injury being perceived. And so we decided to look at the single cell level by using single cell RNA sequencing at exactly what might, what might be going on within the cultures. And so this is a work done in collaboration with Catherine Plath and Justin Langerman. And what we noted in these red boxes is that the number of viral transcripts, the gene expression within the cells is markedly reduced when virus is um, introduced into the cultures, whereas smoking um, seems to have very little effect on the number of transcripts. And looking at this in a different way, we looked at these heat maps and really what these do is show us patterns of gene expression across these four different groups and whether gene expression goes up or down. And the prevailing pattern that we saw was that in the setting of um, virus infection, either with or without cigarette smoke, it looked very similar, um, but that we see that most of the genes are down-regulated in expression, whether there's no cigarette smoke or there is cigarette smoke. Although, of course, other patterns exist, for example, we do see that some genes are increased in the setting of viral infection. And this particular group over here was very interesting to us. This is genes that are increased in expression in the setting of just viral infection, but are decreased when there's viral infection with smoking. And what was really interesting to us is that in this particular group, we found that the interferon response genes, which are very important in immune function um, within the airway epithelium, that they were decreased in the setting of cigarette smoke. And this implied to us that cigarette smoke reduces the interferon response. And therefore, this may be at least one of the mechanisms whereby the virus is able to get into the cells and why we see so many more infected cells in the setting of cigarette smoke. And so to look at this further, we performed another experiment. And this time what we did is to think about adding interferon beta to the cultures in comparison to remdesivir, which is used clinically um, and, and has a response in patients to see whether interferon beta uh, might have an effect on the cultures, especially in the setting of cigarette smoke exposure. And so here's the data. And I hope you can appreciate this first column uh, is no drug. I'm um, just showing you the viral infection and how much more there is with cigarette smoke. In, with interferon beta-1, we found a complete abrogation of infection. So we completed, completely prevented infection, even in the setting of cigarette smoke. And with remdesivir, um, we saw a good effect as well, although there was slightly more infection than what we saw with interferon beta. And this is quantified by these graphs. So in summary, um, what I've shown today is that we really believe that cigarette smoke has a, has a large impact on the airways and that at least acute cigarette smoke exposure um, makes people more at risk uh, for having more, um, more virally infected cells and therefore we believe more severe viral infection. And so I really want to acknowledge my wonderful lab who, despite the pandemic, um, have worked really hard to generate what we think is very important data. And I also want to acknowledge Vaiti Ramagaswamy, without whom we would not be able to do the viral infections. And Gus Garcia, who's a very talented technician in his lab, has also been instrumental in all of this work. And I want, also want to acknowledge Catherine Plath, Justin Langerman, and the UCLA Molecular Shared Screening Resource, and Robert Damaso for all their work. And I also want to um, thank CIRM very much for their funding, because without this funding, we would really not be able to do any of this COVID-19 work. And um, we're hoping that this will lead to greater understanding of the disease and also ultimately, hopefully, to a therapy.
Thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.